Y'all had a, a pretty big Saturday. How was that? Yeah. What did you end up watching? Did you watch Point Break? Yeah, no, damn, we didn't watch Point Break. <laughs> How dare you? First off, all the people, all the people have been saying is you know publicly and privately the dms are flooded with how dare they not watch point break and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna have to agree with, with the audience. thank you part of love verse something there the refinery episode eight y'all Jesus. time's flying it's crazy flying, flying. um so who wants to introduce today? Brandon, I think it's kind of your job at this point. <laughs> like, it's like super unspoken, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're talking about heartbreak. We're talking about uh, this idea of even recovering from heartbreak in your process. Are you still recovering? Have you recovered? Uh, how tough it can be, how easy it can be. Uh, maybe you've had a couple, maybe it's relational, maybe it's a job, right? Heartbreak isn't just romantic. Did you, wait, hold on, with pause, hold on. What's it's happening? full of gin. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're good. <laughs> it was harder to transport here. <laughs> I didn't have space for the big bottles. <laughs> I like you knew where the question was going. <laughs> Yeah. So heartbreak. We're talking heartbreak, recovering from heartbreak, and all the beautiful things that come with it. Yeah. Nice. Um, well, lead us off. Lead us off, huh? Jesus. Yeah. Well, gents, it's uh, only tradition that we cheers. There you go. It's a lot. And, uh, it's like a very big swig, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Right about the time you get done with your answer. Mine will be kicking out. I'll be like, no, 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 John. I'm in, I got this. I'm going to talk for an hour. I'm sorry. Keep going. Um, dude, so heartbreak. I was thinking about it on the way home, and I was like, okay, what do I go with? Do I go with my dog that my, my uncle decided to uh, put up for adoption against my will? Uh, do I go with the girl who I was dating for like six months and cheated on me and I thought we were gonna be together forever. Or do I go with, I had all these different scenarios in my life where heartbreak was prevalent. And where I ended up landing was, um, there was someone who I was really, really um, in love with. And I think what got me was the story of our love more so than the actual heartbreak itself is the story. And so, uh, yeah. I saw her for the first time in 2008, 2009 at a dance studio. Gorgeous, and I'll never forget because I worked there at the time. And her hair was pretty much down to her, like, to her lower back. Uh, she had on these cargo shorts and like a yellow tank top and these, these like particular shoes. And she goes in to take dance class. And I think to myself, who is that? Like, who is that woman? And like a jackass. I don't have the confidence to walk up to her and get her name or get her number or get anything. So I'm hoping because I work at the studio at the time that she's gonna come back the next week because as dancers, we know that same class is gonna repeat week after week after week. So I know in my mind, next Wednesday at six o'clock, she's gonna be walking in the studio. I don't see this woman for a year and a half. <laughs> And when I do see her, it is at a different studio and I'm taking class now and I'm in class, I'm doing the moves or whatever, and I'm hitting them and I'm like, bow, 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 and a six, seven, and an eight, and I'm in the mirror in the front. And she, and I look, because I'm so focused, I actually take a second to look like who's behind me. And she's reaching up to tap me on the shoulder and she's like, hey, 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 what, what is that? Um, can you show me that count again? And I remember freezing thinking, oh my God, this is her. Because she has no idea she's the her in my head. Right. Oh my God, this is her. So I teach her the moves or whatever. We take class together. And I have, a, I have, a, I have my own at, at Debbie at the time. I'm teaching freestyle. So I'm like, all right, I have an opportunity. I got a little more confidence here to say something to this woman. I go up to her and I say, hey, listen, I have a class here. I'd love for you to come take. It's on Tuesdays, uh, you know, whatever. 
And she's like, oh, that'd be dope. Thanks again for class. Thanks for helping me out. I was like, uh, you know, back at you and just leave, right? Just no, yeah. And at the time, I know I had game, but this woman has sucked all the game. It's not prevalent. It's not even existing. Not smooth, nothing. So fast forward to an audition a year later, right? So now this goes from seeing her, me, randomly running into her. Now we're at this audition together. And I'm telling my boys and everybody, that's her. No, that's the girl I've been telling you all about. She's so beautiful. She's amazing. She's great. But we were friends on Facebook after the, the class we took together. And I had reached out a couple of times and she was ghosting me. So I was like, man, forget her. But also you're here and I want to say hi to you, but I don't really know how to do this without seeming weird. I kid you not, she's sitting on the floor in front of like the lobby area and she's got her headphones in. And out of nowhere, I just say, hey, you, I need to talk to you, come with me. And I keep walking. And I think this is gonna work. And I'm praying to God that when I look behind me or when I sit down, she's going to be there. That's my prayer. So I turn around and there she is standing in front of me. And she's like, excuse me, do I, do I know you? And I'm like, oh, this is embarrassing. But she came over. <laughs> Come to find out she knew exactly who I was. She was giving me a hard time because I talked to her that way. She's like, you're not going to talk to me like that. And I was like, uh uh, learned my lesson. We ended up dating after that. I mean, and we got really, and we, we got in there fast, and we got in there heavy. And she was the first woman that I had ever really thought to myself, I could, I could marry her. That was my first time ever feeling that way. So fast forward to seven months in, about seven months in, we had a pregnancy scare. And, uh, I remember like going to get the plan B pill the next morning and all these different things and thinking to my, I was broke at the time, I mean broke, broke at the time. We were both like just getting started to dance, 23, somewhere around there. And I remember that being a shift in our relationship and making it very, very real for us at that time. Like, okay, well, if we were to have a kid, what would happen, right? You can't tell the future right now with, you booking maybe a job a month, me booking a job a month, not really either one of we both have roommates. To add a kid to this would be crazy. So I remember things kind of taking a really nasty turn and just not being the same. And one day we were in the car and I was like, yo, so if we did have that kid, like what would happen? She's like, I don't know. I think, you know, I would move back in my grandma in La Puente and we raised the baby there and this and that and that. And I was like, Yo, I'm like not in this equation. This is like you and the baby and you like being a single mom taking care of this child we've made. And like, that's a, this is alarming to me. You know, we went from talking about we're going to have kids together to now you saying, you know, I, me, 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 I'll take care of the kid. So I remember that moment thinking to myself, shit, she doesn't think I can provide for this family or this kid because in her mind, it's all about her and what she has to do. So I was moving out of the apartment I was in to show her <laughs> that I could be a provider. I had, I, I, uh, I had just booked a big job, I had booked a tour, and I had some money coming in. So immediately, I told my two roommates at the time, hey guys, I'm moving out. And I got approved for this studio apartment uh, on Magnolia, and I was that was my beginning. That was my beginning to like my own life, if you will, independence. And I think it's like the week of me moving in, and I call her because I have like I have to move out of my old apartment, but I need like three or four days in between to move my stuff into my new place. But we have to be out of my old place, so I call her and I'm like, hey. Why don't I just come stay with you for a couple nights, whatever the case may be, and I'll move in my new place, I'll move in. She's like, sure. I'm like, where are you at? She's like, oh, I'm at, um, I'm at this park that's like a block away from me. But she didn't tell me she was at this park. So I'm like, why didn't you tell me you were at this, you know, this park? Like, you're right by me. Come over. She comes over. She's sitting on the couch. 
she's like super like not present at all. And I pick up on this because apparently I've learned recently I'm an empath. Uh, we go out of her car and I'm like, yo, what's going on with you? Like, you're acting weird. You're acting really funny right now. Like, you're not you. And uh, she's like, I don't know. I'll call you later. I just need to think about something. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is a big life thing right now. Like, I have to move out of my apartment and go live with you. But I can tell there's something about us that's happening right now. So I get into the car. We talk for like 10 minutes. And then I can just see she's got this like lump in her throat. And she's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember that moment thinking, what? We just talked an hour ago about me coming to stay with you for a couple of nights. I've got my apartment. I'm doing this. I'm trying to show you that I can be you know, the guy you need me to be and provide and all these different things. And you're breaking up with me here and now. And I remember, I remember this dream that I had created in my head. Then we talk about heartbreak. I had this dream or this reality I had created in my head of like life with her, things we had talked about, things we would do together. This was like the most massive heartbreak of my life. Now the story does not end there, but for the sake of the conversation, I'll say this woman was in and out of my life for the next, that was 2011. I think we finally stopped really being each other's lives in 2000, last year. No, was it last year? Last year, I would say we stopped being each other's lives completely. So. So how did you deal with that? <laughs> Drinking? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's not, no, no. Yeah. But um, no, I think, I think a lot of it, there's so much to this story that I, I couldn't really go into all of the details um, because it's, it's deeply rooted. It goes into my religion. It goes into a lot of spiritual things. And I think what helped me to get past it was me me taking ownership of my story. That's what was kind of the like, the moment of shift, right? I had allowed um, a lot of different things to shape the story that I was living in in a hope that it would, for, it would be a fulfilled prophecy. Not realizing that I have all the say, all the choice uh, in the matter. So if I, if I decided, that this wasn't it, then this wasn't it. Or looking at what's clearly in front of me and saying, this isn't it. Right. Um, you know, I think, I think that's when everything shifted for me. Yeah, for, for sure. That's when everything shifted for me. Taking, taking control of my story. So taking control of your kind of, of your story gave you power over your part of y'all's story and not holding her for how it played out for her, ah, right? Yeah. Not being the victim and then not thinking you did this, you create, you know what I'm saying? You created, no, because I equally played a part in accepting, receiving, being when she comes back around or I come back around. Those, those are all choices we made yeah. for that story to play out the way it did. And so I think that's been the biggest thing for me in relationships period is like, I only have responsibility for my shit. And I only can speak on uh, what I've done. And I don't necessarily look at someone on the other side the way that I used to from like a victim standpoint, right? Like you're a bad person, you yeah. did wrong, or you, you know, you, you stayed, you saw things, you ignored things, right? Like I'm equally as responsible for the outcome of the relationship. Um, as the other person so i think that's been the biggest healing thing and the recovering thing but that process of gosh almost saw her for the first time in 2008 i mean that's a long time yeah 
you know? And then last year, maybe two years ago, finally just being like, so, yeah. Sorry, there's something that I'm trying to formulate. Um, John, go. You go on if you if you're ready. I'm gonna I'm gonna let it sit for a second. I can't take this. What are you doing? <laughs> no, it's um. There's. I'm interested. I want to keep going at this. We're gonna keep going at this in a second. John, go ahead. John, jump, jump on it, John. All right. Um. Yeah. I. Someone of a similar situation in the sense that if something that came in my life got kind of serious quick. Um, we got really connected, really vulnerable. There was op multiple opportunities where we got real vulnerable with each other. So we really got deep connected and everything. And she had just gotten a long term relationship about a year and a half before. So I was thinking that, uh, all right, that's long enough that they've, that's, they've, she's moved on and everything like that. And we were doing fine. And I had met this guy one time. Um, and I had just had a feeling of this guy. And I remember bringing it up one day to her. I was like, hey, does your ex know, know about me that you and I are talking? And she was just like, no. Because I knew they were still friends. They, they still had like business together and they still had all the stuff that they still connected every once in a while for old stuff. Um, and I really told her one day and I was just like, yo, I have a feeling when he finds out he's going to have a revelation that he made a big mistake. Like, I think she was like, no, there's no way I'd get back with him. I'm like, I understand that, but I think he's gonna he's gonna show back up. I have this feeling. And like two weeks later, I come to pick her up. I think we're going to dinner or something like that. And she's on the phone the, on the sidewalk and she's just like, just give me a second. I'm like, all right. And I remember telling him, I'm like, yo, I think because they always talked about like never wanted children, never really wanted to like move or anything like that. Um, and so I remember telling him, like, he might bring these things up. Like when this when he comes to find out it's me that you're dating. And so she gets in the car and she's like, hey, so he knows. And I'm like, how do you find out? And she's like, I guess he saw us somewhere. Um, but he just told me that he made the biggest mistake in his life and that he wants to be back with me. He wants to have kids with me. He wants all the stuff I basically, wow. and I remember telling myself, I'm like, did I accidentally manifest this almost too perfectly? Cause like every single thing I said, Hey, he's going to say these things. He said them. And so it became this whole long conversation back and forth. Actually, no, you know, what? I was picking her up to take her to the airport. Cause she, she was going on a solo trip to I think Thailand or Cambodia or something like that. And I was just like, Hey, look, like, is, is, is there something still coming up for you? Cause if there isn't, then there's, it's easy. You can shut this down. And she was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. This is like throwing a whole bunch of stuff, like bring a whole bunch of stuff up. And I was like, all right, well, look, you're going to, you're on this trip, like take this time with yourself and figure out what you want. Um, just check in with me. Let me know you're doing okay. So she went, I didn't, she checked in every once in a while, just to let me know she's okay. But like on the third day she calls me and she's like, hey, look, he's been hitting me up every day and I've been talking to him, trying to figure this out. And I don't feel it's fair that I'm only talking to him, I'm not talking to you. I'm like, okay, you're gonna talk to both of us? I'm not, like, I'm not trying to do that. And she's like, well, no, I'm trying to figure what's going on, but I also wanna know where your head's at. And long story short, she gets back and I was like, look, is there a what if? Like, what if this could have worked out? What if you could have had kids together? And she was like, yeah. I'm like, then go to him. Cause I was like, nothing is going to happen between us two unless you go and figure that what if, cause that's always going to be back here. So go and figure that out. And so we end up splitting and that was the hardest because it was almost like a, I was trying to be the good guy and being like, Hey, the right thing is that you go figure it out. But my ego was like, please choose me. Like don't choose the other guy in this. Like I'm giving you the door out, but I really hope you choose me in the end. You're telling me I'm wrong. But she did what she was supposed to do. She, she went out and she um, went to, by the way, I have the, the camera's on Brandon right now. Is that, I don't know if uh, it's going to be audible. It's going to be all of <laughs> Brandon's um, response. But. No, this is spotlighted on you, it should be. And it's pinned on you. Brandon, you see him, right? It is on you right now. On me? I have you pinned on here. What I'll do is I'll just spotlight it. I just wanted to make sure you could still see us. Do you see yeah. you now? Yeah, I got there it. We go. All right, perfect. Um, but it was funny because it was like the hard, it was a hard thing to swallow being like, man, well, I've created this. I was the one who suggested you go to back to him. And then she did. And I was like, well, shit. 
uh, I remember the last thing I told her, I'm like, hey, just pay attention about a month, month and a half is where he's going to go back to his old place. So I said that kind of like my ego was talking in that sense. But so the hardest part is I talked to a friend of mine and she was just like, yo, you just have to sit with that pain. Like don't, and I'm a person who intellectualizes my feelings. I've always been able to rationalize whatever's happened in my life. I'm always make sense of it. So that way I can like lower the actual impact emotionally. So I don't have to feel it. Oh, I make sense of it. Oh, this is why it happened. This is what it taught me. This is whatever, whatever. I've been told I'm very good at intellectualizing my feelings. And so my friend was like, yo, don't, don't do that. Sit every day for 10 minutes. Fucking just sit with pain. And like, I remember for a week, every morning, I get kind of do my little morning routine, whatnot. And then I would just sit on my couch in my room. And I would just like, the first couple of days, I would just cry for like 10, 15 minutes. And then I finally was just like, all right, well, that sucked. Still sucks. But I'm going to move on with my day. So I have stuff to do. Um, and it helped big time uh, to get through it and really allow me to experience the feeling of, of letting go of someone and like the pain of like, shitty, but this is long story needs to happen. And what's crazy is that a month and a half later, I think the same thing happened. Um, everything I told her with this guy happened. He basically went back to his old ways, said, I don't want to have kids. And so they ended up splitting again. And then she hits me up two months later, we reconnect. So we start going back out and we start dating and everything and we're having a great time. And it was kind of like maybe five, six months later, uh, I would start asking him like, Hey, like you had that reconnect with him. And like, I know you guys separated for a while, but I'm like, did you ever heal from that whole thing? Like, did you actually take time to heal or am I just distracting you from actually healing? Yeah. And she's like, no, there's no way. No, no, no. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And then, so she again was doing a solo trip and this is new year's like two years ago, I think. Yeah. Two years ago. Um, she was going to Japan. And so I was just like, Hey, I need you to take that time. Take this trip again, just check in with me. Let me know you're okay. But take this time to really ask yourself, are you healing? Or are you distracted? And she went, she came back and like within the first 15 minutes of picking her from the airport, I'm like, all right, so you healing or you're distracted? She's like, I'm fucking distracted. I'm like, fuck. And she goes, oh. she's like, you make me so happy. Why would I think about being sad? Why would I go yeah. to that painful area? when I can just be with you and be happy. I'm like, yeah, but that's not how this unfortunately works. Like you need to go through that healing process and this is not going to, this is going to crash and burn down the road. And so I was just like, yo, we, we unfortunately once again have to part ways and you got to do you. And I remember that night it was, I picked up at the airport probably like six, seven. We hung out all night. Um, and what was amazing, I remember her asking me, she's like, how are you okay right now with the fact that we're splitting up again? And like, you kind of like brought this to the table. I'm like, here's my option. I can either convince you that we stay together. We try to make this work for a few more months and then we crash and burn in like six months. And then we don't have friendship. We don't have anything. My other option is that we accept what it is right now and we move on and we don't burn this friendship and we stay friends. And like, we still are friends. I actually, coincidentally, we were messaging earlier today, um, just catching up. And, but it was that moment of sitting with the pain. And cause I did it again after, after we split a second time, I sat every single day with that pain. I think that was one of the biggest things is just sitting and acknowledging what I was feeling in the moment and not trying to be like, well, this is part of life or this is what life is trying to teach me or anything like that is really just sit with it, sit with that pain, yeah. allowing, not like not labeling it, not judging it, not criticizing it, not trying to downplay it, like allowing it to just really come up and just feel it and just acknowledge, Hey, this is what you're going through. And then after that, little by little, it became easier and easier. And it's, been a good lesson like anytime i've lost anything or have heartbreak i'm like all right well this is gonna suck but i might as well get done now rather than later might as well just sit through this pain now and not mask it and then in six months it's gonna show up in the most random place and i'm gonna have to deal with it then so yeah yeah i think what you are talking about what we're what we're all talking about i'm gonna go back to gallery view for a moment um and that's why I was taking notes on that. It's something we talked about in a, a recent episode. I don't remember which one. I think it was, and whether, whether or not it was an actual episode or maybe it was one of our just straight refinery talks. Like, but I remember Matt was there, uh, I believe. We're talking about the color palette, right? Like, we don't, we don't want to feel these things, but you're going to one way or the other. And that's the, like, Brandon, you said something about, you know, you are 100% in charge of your things. And, I always feel like I'm 50% in charge of everything. 
I'm exactly 50% in charge of everything that happens. And I know what you mean. You're 100% in charge of your actions and what you do. Right, right. But I always feel that I'm 50% in charge of anything that happens in my life. I can do everything I can, but like I can, I can push it down and that those colors are going to come out in some way later down the road, or I can feel them and it's just going to be spread out over a little bit of time. And maybe it's less time overall, but maybe it's more time. It's just fucking terrible. Like no matter what life is beautiful and life is fucking brutal. And we don't get out of it. No matter how nice we are, no matter how mean we are, no matter how shitty we are, no matter how fucking great we are, the best men, the worst men the, you will always, it's going to suck. It's going to be yeah. fucking off. Awesome. Now, now the thing is we have the choice of whether or not it's also going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what both of you are, are talking about, which I love so much. Um, so the things that I kind of made notes on are, um, I, I don't have a specific story of rejection because I have so many stories of rejection. It seems, it seems hard for me to pinpoint just one, whether it's relationships or, or professionally, um, even within my, you know, current relationship, even within life, you know, um, just there's so fucking much of it. Uh, I've had horrible relationship issues and, you know, best friends sleeping with girls I've been with for years and then getting back with those girls and then having that go south. And it's a personal thing. I've had jobs that, you know, you talked about earlier, Brandon, you said, you know, jobs, were also a part of it and, and they really are. I mean, we are, especially, I know that I can only speak to what the business that you and I are in, um, yeah. but Gorski, I'm assuming this is a universal thing because it affects apparently everybody else in the world. But yeah. whenever I talk to anybody, I say, look, you, if you're a performer, your job is performing, but that secondary job is auditioning. And yes. that's the art of, of being, okay with no and okay with rejection and i always say that or i've heard that said so much but i don't know that i believe it i'm not i'm okay with rejection in the sense that if i go into a room and i do what i think is everything that i can do i take the direction the best i can i do the things the way the, the best i can if you end up being like and i'm happy with the product that i put out if at the end of the day you go no like I, I can be okay with that. You know what I mean? If I, I've lost jobs to other people and seen them in like, let's say a film, like this has happened a couple of times in the last couple of years where I'll get an audition for a really big film or a really big show. And I'm like, Oh fuck, this is so cool. And you prep for it and you go and you do it and you feel really good. And then it doesn't happen. And then you see the show or you see the movie and you're like, I get it. And you don't always feel like that, but sometimes you're yeah. like, cool. That said, I think on the relationship side of things or the professional, but specifically relationship wise, I wrote down, we all tend to do this thing where, and I mean the three of us, um, we rush into things, right? When we hit that relation, and I'm guessing it's also professionally, we, <laughs> we, when we find something that fits, we want it to be the last thing. Like this is the one that fits, and we build that out. Like you were talking about. And that's it. And this yeah, is you, it. it's yeah. it's fantasy nation. Like okay, I know that when I get a script, I'm like, who? I'm imagining set, and who else is going to be in it, and what's it going to be like? And yes. I, you know, m used to meet somebody, I'd be like, oh my god, what is this going to be like? And wow what would our kid like i immediately go all the way down the road way past mm. hi let's go on a date do you actually even fit with me and then when we start to fit every little thing that kind of fits is is huge oh my god that's what, and then the things that really don't fit it, 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 <laughs> what about this though remember where we agreed on that thing and so i thought it was really interesting the way that i've tended to deal with rejection is by forcing uh by forcing myself to do this thing it started two years ago i stopped doing new year's resolutions i started picking words or thoughts and trying to focus on that and fixing that part of myself that year yeah. and i haven't been able to do it but it's definitely something that i get better at every time <laughs> um 
one of them, my first one was perspective. And it was just understanding that. And that really is kind of still this same thing is putting everything back in a perspective and accepting the world as it is given to me, not as someone says, but as I understand it. You know what I mean? So a relationship is not what I make it out to be 10 years from now. It's what it is right now. And that's it. And that's how I've found is healthiest for me to deal with rejection. I do not always do it. Uh, it is very easy for me to fall into old patterns, but that is, um, that is my main kind of course of action. And the last thing, this was something, John, you said, but I think we, again, all do this. I wonder if we manifest our own rejection, not in the sense though of, uh, the existential ethereal sense of manifestation and the original version of the secret. And if you just think about it, that's it. And it's not, it's, I wonder if it's by talking about it, are we putting that idea in their heads and saying, Hey, could be though, like, no, like he's going to come back. Well, if he comes back, that's best case scenario. She, if she didn't want to break up in the first place, like she wanted him to be that guy. And we're saying, Hey, he's going to come back and be that guy. I don't know if he's going to be that guy, but he's going to be that guy. And then we're simultaneously being the nice guy, which makes us feel better. And I've had that same conversation, John, that you had not like with her, but like with someone where you're like, look, this isn't going to work right now because you're not in the right place. And in my head, I'm like, and this will show you that I'm the right <laughs> guy. <laughs> and that's, and this, this is the hard part is that's the population. <laughs> Yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 Well, part of it is manipulation. Yeah. Part of it depends on what your intention is. Yeah. No, no. And I don't think it's intent. I mean, I, for me, it wasn't intentional manipulation. It was this same version of, of I think I, I think the video came out about games. Like we, we play these games to we try do. and do these things. And maybe we don't yeah. know that we're doing it for that purpose. But the truth is, at the end of the day, if you don't say the exact thing for the reason, it's, it's for manipulation. And it doesn't mean that's, that's uh, with malice, yeah. intentionally malicious, but at the end of the day, that is what it is. And so we've gotten ourselves yeah. as a society, I think, into a place where dating games, which is manipulating someone's psychology to like you more, by lying in some way, shape or form has become the norm. How many things that we talk about are the norm? It's all fucking crazy what we've just allowed to happen. And hopefully what yeah. we're here with the refinery is trying to break those things away. Mm -hmm. So yeah, which then leads to the shadow and all Jungian philosophy and we go down the rabbit hole and we do not Oh, we have time for that. It's 14 minutes. We can unravel philosophy. No, 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 no. It's not. But I, I think I think that the most important thing to focus on what you said, man, is I remember someone talking about this when it comes to people who cheated on. Is that you'll manifest because you're looking so much for the signs. You're looking so much for the the is this person, you know, hiding their phone? Is this person doing what the last person did? you're you ultimately get the thing that will feed the victim and we talked about this before killing the victim letting the victim die but it's the same thing in relationship you know and i it's so funny we, we, as i was driving when i was driving just now i thought about this idea of me i'll say me do i believe what i've been saying about what i deserve when it comes to love do I really believe that I deserve it? And do my actions reflect it by what I accept, what I walk away from, what I say yes to, and what I say no to? Outside of me, I think a lot of people don't even have a concept of what the other love or good love is even it even looks like because you can only know love to the extent of your experience 
and anything outside of that will scare the shit out of you. Which is why a lot of people run. A lot of people get scared because it's so foreign, so alien to them that they they fear the unknown. So we stick with the familiar. And what I'm challenging myself to do is to get away from the familiar, which is the victim mentality of continuing to manifest these outcomes and lean into something different, which means though you have the vision and insight to see 10 years down the road, don't miss what's happening today in this moment. Dig it. Well, to add to that, I think one of the other things that's interesting when we don't ask, have that self-worth conversation with, with ourselves, if we deserve something, well, and I know this from past experiences, that if I don't think I deserve something, I will be the one to self-sabotage to get myself out of that because I don't think I'm supposed to be there or supposed mm. to have to be with that person. So I will start making mistakes to basically get out of a situation that I don't think I'm supposed to be in. And it's not until we actually look at why are we doing that? Why are we to one, push someone away, but even deeper, why do we not think we're worthy of that kind of love or having someone care, or someone be there for us? And it's really when we get deep into that, that we can really start asking, you know, what's the thing that we still need to heal? The thing that that's a big part of it is there's something that happened in our past. Like, Brandon, you mentioned, You've been cheated on. I've been cheated on in the past. Um, I don't know if Colt you have, but it's like it does something to you when you get cheated on. And if you don't, at some point, look back at that experience and ask, okay, what, what did I take out of that? Like what's yeah. that? Because a lot of times when we have pain, if we don't sit with it, what we do is we like. I would rather just talk from my past experience. Is like when I felt pain at certain times, I've run from that pain. I've gone somewhere far where I don't feel that pain. And the issue is that in that moment, I labeled that pain something. And so if that pain ever showed up in another form, but similar, mm -hmm. I would run from that because I'm like, I don't want to experience that. Bad. And like, I didn't, perfect example of making assumptions off something, and this is what I got when I was a kid, is that I had an experience when I was a child where I was trying to get my mom's attention. She was on the phone arguing with, I didn't know who at the time. Um, and she walked out of the apartment. I remember being like, oh man, she's abandoning me. I am in need of her and she's leaving. Like, why, why would she leave? And for years I carried this, like this part of my mom's an amazing woman. She's always been there, but part of me always has been like, oh, when I really need her, is she gonna dip out? And it wasn't until I did like this workshop and it, and it was all about confronting those parts that we don't want to look at. And I look, and that, that experience came to mind. And I remember calling my mom, I'm like, hey, any chance you remember this? And she was like, I actually do. I was in, a, I was in an argument with your dad and I didn't want you to know I was arguing with your dad. So I went into the hallway. I was like, I knew you were behind the door, but I had to deal with your dad. I didn't want you to see us arguing. So mm -hmm. I took this from mom was abandoning me. My mom was actually trying to protect me from something. But if I didn't actually come back, look at that experience, see what it caused, and then actually confront it, I would still sit here and be wondering, oh man, one day my mom's going to abandon me. And it's, I think that's the same thing with relationships. I think that's with, I mean, if we get cheated on, I mean, and not even just with love relationships, but even like you were saying with work. Like we get suddenly let go from a job. We have no idea and we didn't get closure of why we got let go until we confront that person like, yo, what, what happened? Like, why did I get let go? Then we can realize, oh, I had nothing to do with me. I had, like they had, they unfortunately had some, there was a hierarchy and there's just the politics of the industry. I had to be let go and now it had nothing to do with me, but yet how much we make our own assumptions and our own of what we think it was. And a lot of times we blame ourselves. So both of you are killing me for so many reasons, not the least of which Brandon and John, both of you have, Brandon hit on it first, step four, uh, red flag four of this Thursday's video. So tomorrow's video, which is edited, uploaded, is what Brandon just talked about, um, that I call it hide and seek. And it's when you're in a relationship and either somebody is hiding something, you know, you can play it as one person or you can play it like both people can be playing, right? Somebody could be hiding something. Somebody could be seeking something that you could find it. And there's, there's, you know, multiple versions of it. One is where you're in a relationship where you're not doing anything wrong, but they've been hurt before. So they're looking, they're looking for your texts, your emails. They're constantly checking in on you. Where are you? Where are you? Are you going to hurt me? Are you going to hurt me? And it's just, it's interesting how cyclical, it all is. Um, yeah. And it was funny that you brought that up when literally I've just, you know, finished editing that. Um, John, you talked about 
cheating, which is literally a previous one of the earlier videos. It was the first video we did for a subscriber, like specifically for about how to get over cheating. And we said, look, you got to look at what that is and to tie it all in, which is fucking crazy with what you did earlier with the email that you sent us. Um, it's literally Carl Jung who talks about the thing that we need most in our lives is always in the place we least want to look. Mm -hmm. So, which is part of our subscriber video, which is a <laughs> whole thing. I mean, literally like this whole thing is just so, it makes me so happy because yeah. this work that we're all doing is so integrally tied to yeah. itself. It makes me so happy that the refinery is here on part of love. It makes me so happy that my connection with you guys is here um, because that, the fight of growing is so often put on moving forward, looking mm -hmm. forward at things. And the truth is the only way we can truly move forward is by looking back, not going back, but looking back and acknowledging that, right? And we talked about that recently. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we have to do that. And it's the most terrifying fucking thing in the world most terrifying thing in the world is to go back to that relationship with that person and go, Hey, what, what didn't I do? Like, why did you, what, mm. why wasn't I enough? Like, what is there something yeah. you don't know if they're emotionally intelligent enough to go there yeah. with you or right. if you're emotionally intelligent enough to accept that, but mm. that's the fight. It's going to our parents and going, Hey, fuck you, man. This sucked. Like, like I love my dad with all my heart. But it was, and Brandon, you talked about this in an episode, like it was yeah. the time that I, I went to him and was like, all right, like, let's fucking talk. Let's really fucking talk about this. You sucked at these things. Yeah. And that led us forward. It was talking to my mom about things that happened in our household. And that's what led us to a relationship that is moving forward in such a beautiful way because it comes out of the truth as much truth as we all have but i think that's the hardest thing for for all of us to do and especially we i think i don't know it's a society as a as a human race as just the, the cognitive beings that we have found ourselves at evolutionarily i don't know but fuck man we want it now we want it fixed now and that's not how this works like you said, John, like you're going to look at an issue, you're going to look at a breakup and you're going to start going into that. And that's going to open Pandora's box of other fucking doors. And then you're going to go into that cave. And that cave is another bunch of caves. And eventually you'll get to the end of one as far as what, like it'll end. It yeah. just does. It doesn't mean you fixed it. It means that's as far as you can go. You come back out. Now you have to go down that one and it's, and it hurts. But I think over time, the more of this kind of stuff that we do, the more natural it gets. And suddenly, instead of just being someone going into a cave for the first time, you're like a professional spelunker of your own emotional mind. You know what I mean? Um, I just, yeah, I dig it. I have one question. Please. You know, I think about you and Ange, right? And you've been in, in my shoes and you've been in John's shoes. And now you're on the other side of fence in a manner of speaking, what yeah. it, it, for you what was your what was your internal thing you shifted that allowed this relationship to flourish it's honest this is going to sound like i'm oversimplifying it and i'm not and it's it's going to be a very hard thing because i'm not this is not a reflection on you guys or anybody watching this yeah. um, as far as like personal attack. But the truth is I, I did two things. One, I stopped caring about myself first. And two, I started caring about myself first. So I loved being the focus of attention. I loved being the one who was going to save everything. I loved being the fucking white knight who was going to come in and fix her life. And her life was great. She didn't fucking need me, but I wanted to be the perfect man. The one who showed up in the fairy tale and was great all the time. And 
but I was doing so much of it so that I would be that instead of actually doing anything that I needed to do. I wasn't saving money so that I could help us. I wasn't learning uh, about, let's say, investing or even just who, what she needed because I was worried about what I needed. But I was only worried about what my ego needed, not what I needed to be better. So mm. when I finally put her first in the sense of I, I took her hand from her father on our wedding day. And I looked him in the eye and said, essentially, I will take care of your daughter. I've got this. I will be the man that you hope I am. And then I didn't. Mm-hmm. when I accepted that I, that I wasn't actually doing that, I was just saying it. It's so easy for us to say things that sound fucking pretty. It's so easy yeah. to make ourselves seem great on paper or on Instagram or fucking wherever. It's really hard to go, okay, maybe, maybe I am angry about some shit that happened and maybe I do need to open up to you and maybe I do spend way too much because I was so broke and I finally came into money and I never dealt with that. And maybe I am a fucking selfish asshole sometimes. And maybe I am not a great like parent to my fucking girls. Like maybe, maybe I kind of suck and maybe I just make myself feel like I'm great. And Maybe if I just step back and look at what I need, what, what that little boy that I've been carrying and protecting the whole time by saying, no, man, no, no, you've got money. Look, I'll buy you this. I'll buy you this. I'll buy you this. Mm-hmm. It's not crying. It's a fucking crime, dude. It's fine. Look, you're, you're getting married. Like, if, look how beautiful she is. You win, you win, you win. Instead of going, hey, motherfucker, this is what happened. You got to look at it. You got to deal with it. Because otherwise I'm going to be carrying you around forever. So until I put her first and put me first, nothing ever changed. And then she, she put up an ultimatum. I came into the house one day. It was our first time living in LA. And uh, I guess this is my rejection story. And we had been in a bad way for a little bit. And this was our first year of marriage. And I walked in and I just kind of, I said, I don't, I can't, I can't keep, living with you hating me and she's and I said I don't know what to do and she said I don't either and we both just like kind of broke down and I said what do you need me to do like how do I fix this and she told me and so I did because I I chose her I chose her over me and by doing so I chose the me that I wanted to be you know so ever since then, that's my goal. I just, I keep being the person that I want to see in the world. I keep being the man that I wish I could try to be like. I, I'm just going to do it. I'm not asking for someone else to do it anymore and hoping that I finally see that. Right, fuck it. My kids won't have to look far. So now you got me all emotional, dude. Um, Amazing. So. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, I, it's something that I think not only I needed. Um, I'm sure John needed. I'm sure you needed. I'm sure anyone listening needed to understand and see that. You know, mending the heart. Um, isn't about putting it back together so it's pretty and perfect. It's about how can I mend this to create more space for healing and love? And it may not be pretty. It may be ugly, distorted, but as long as there's room in that space for you to breathe, which I'm learning to do, for you to accept for you to lean in and for you to love, you will never stop growing. Well, that that puts out something. It's really easy to draw the heart that we all know, right? It's really easy right. to it's really easy to draw this little motherfucker. 
That's super yeah. easy, right? Yeah. It's really hard to draw an actual heart. I also want to add, I, I forget the, the Japanese word for it, but there is a Japanese practice that when a bowl or a vase or something breaks, they fix it with gold. And the whole idea is that that's where the real character comes from. It's what? The, yeah. That is this it. conversation, I'm boy. <laughs> what? That's what it comes down to is like really the piece of art is really when it, the base goes through something and it, it's not perfect anymore. Nothing is perfect. And it talks about that. Even it's like the, the, they would fix it always with gold because they wanted the cracks to shine. They wanted it to be, to realize that is what makes this thing unique. Not that it's perfect, but it has its own character. Hell yeah. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Refinery episode eight. Um, if you, for some reason, are still not subscribed to this channel, <laughs> you're going to subscribe right down here. Uh, if you want to watch more Refinery videos, you're going to go way over into that corner. Whoa. And uh, you can find everybody's social media uh, on, down in the description box. Leave comments. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know what you want us to talk about in the future. Although there are no shortage of things <laughs> that we are going to be talking about. You guys, thanks so much. Love y'all. Love you guys. As always, Man. this is great. <laughs> Talk to y'all later.